Hey everyone, Steve from Backcountry Gallery here, and in this video we're going to set up the menu on my new Z7 Mark II. The Z6 Mark II setup is exactly the same. This setup is with the original firmware and was actually done back in December, I just now got around to putting the video together. Before we begin, I do want to be clear. We're only going to cover the menu options that I change along with a very brief explanation of why I change them. In several places, I mention other related videos that do go into far more detail and those are linked in the description area for this video on YouTube and under the blog post for this video at my site. Also, keep in mind I'm primarily a wildlife photographer, so these are settings that work well for that pursuit. And finally, remember that just because I set up my camera a certain way, doesn't mean you have to choose those exact same settings. We all shoot a little differently, and what works for me may be a bad fit for you. This is a long one, so let's get started right now. Okay, so here we are looking at the back of the Z7. It's telling me no lenses attached, which it's not. So, so far so good. It knows what's going on at least. So I'm gonna hit the menu button and we're going to go into the setup menu here. And I do confess I was in the menu just a moment ago because I wanted to extend the delay for the timeout on the menu so it doesn't like flip off when we're trying to talk about it here. So other than that though, this is untouched. Normally when you come in here, you would just see the uh, setup menu and it would be set to language. If the language is fine, then you don't have to worry about that. So the next one down here is time zone and date. We're gonna set that real quick. Time zone, I'm in Eastern. New York will work, hit okay. Date and time. I am doing this on December 13th, so 2020 and Time is 12.50. Close enough. There we go. I don't care about the format. Daylight savings time is off, so that's good. We're all set there. Next, let's go down here. And again, I'm only going to show you the stuff here that I would actually adjust. I'm not going to go through every single setting. Uh, let's go down to, when I, sometimes I'll use AF fine tuning, usually on the Z cameras it's not necessary, but if I do happen to have a lens that looks like it's back focusing or front focusing a little, little bit, I would revisit this section, but that doesn't usually happen on the Z cameras, so I'm not too worried about that one. Save focus position, now this is a new one for the Z6 and the Z7 Mark II. And this is really handy. What this does, why it's not on by default, I don't know. But what this does is normally with the old cameras, when you shut the camera off, it would kind of park the autofocus with a native lens. It would park it around infinity, which was really annoying. So if you were out maybe waiting on a sunset and you have everything pre-focused ready to go and you're just sitting there kind of waiting for the light to get good and then you shut the camera off to conserve batteries, what would happen is when you turn the camera back on, focus would change and you'd have to refocus and get everything set just at the moment that you really wanted to take the photo. So I recommend coming in and turning this on. And what that'll do is when you're out shooting and you turn the camera off, it will remember where the lens is supposed to be focused and it won't bring you back up to infinity or whatever it was doing there before. So definitely turn that on. Let's see here, copyright information, we should probably do that. Artist, I'm gonna fast forward through this stuff for you so you don't have to watch me do it. And then copyright. Okay, so I have all my information there. I have the artist information on it, which is just my name. And then copyright, I put copyright 2020 Steve Perry, all rights reserved. I think that's the best way to do your copywriting there. I'm gonna check this little attach copyright information box as well. I'm gonna hit okay and I'm all done. So let's scroll through here. There's not much left here. I'm gonna check the beep options, make sure they're off, which they are. I do not like the camera to beep, but if you do, this is where you would turn it on. Touch controls are on, not worried about any of that. Airplane mode, I'm gonna turn airplane mode on because I don't use any of the Wi-Fi or Bluetooth features of the camera at this time. So I'm just gonna turn that on so those aren't trying to run in the background. I don't think they take much energy, but still, might as well keep the airplane mode on there and disable those. And going down here. And that does it, that's all we have here. That's Again, I don't change a whole heck of a lot, especially in the setup menu here. So let's move on to the, let's go back up to the top towards the playback menu. Let's go to the first one. This is the main one I change in here, which is playback display options. Give that a click. The first one is focus point. I'm gonna go ahead and check that. You can either tap that with your finger 
or you can use the right hand side of the little multi-selector button there that has the OK button in the center of it. If you do that, it'll check and uncheck those for you like so. Now, by the way, the add info is for just adding info to the existing screen. This will, on the main screen that shows you your photo, the default one, it's also going to put the focus point on there. It's not going to add another screen that you can select that will have that. Now, these next ones here will add another screen that you can look at when you're reviewing your images. So when you hit the play button, you go left and right on that little multi-selector button to go from image to image. But if you go up and down, it'll page through these different screens. So I like the exposure info one. I like highlights especially. That's probably my most used one. I use highlights all the time. Uh, blinkies we also call them. I have a whole video out, out there about that if you want to learn how those work. I will put the RGB histogram in there. I'm not going to put shooting data in there though because it's like three pages to scroll through worth of data that I probably already know since I set all those uh, exposure points myself on the camera anyway. The overview is a nice one to have. And my favorite, one of my favorites anyway, is none, believe it or not. This just shows you the image on the back of the camera. I find this incredibly handy when I just want to evaluate a composition. A lot of times when I'm taking pictures in the field, I want to just look at the image I've captured. I don't really need all the extra information. I just need to see that photo and see if I like the composition or not. And this allows me to do that. So once you have all these selected, now I selected a bunch of them here. Obviously, you don't have to do that, whatever works for you. But I'm going to hit OK. The rest of these, I pretty much leave at the default there. Rotate tall, I do turn that off. And this is kind of, some people go one way, some people go another. Basically what this does is when you take a photo in the vertical orientation and you're looking at the camera in a horizontal orientation, it'll show you the vertical photo on the back of the camera. However, I don't like it doing that because if I'm taking a photo in a vertical orientation, there's a good chance I'm on a tripod anyway, and even if I'm not, I want to see the vertical photo in a vertical format on the back of the camera. If the camera's being held vertical, I want to see the vertical version of the photo. So I turn this off, but there is one little catch here. If you turn this off, a lot of raw processing programs, when you import your photos, you're going to have to actually manually rotate them. So, you know, you could go one way or the other there, but I do like to turn that one off. And that's pretty much it for the playback menu. I say not much for that particular menu there. Next, let's go to the photo shooting menu. And there's a few in here that I like. The first one is file naming. The default is DSC. So I'm going to jump in here and change that to something else. And you can see there's actually two different versions of file naming there. If you're shooting sRGB, you have an underscore between the DSC and the number. And for Adobe RGB, it's in front of it there. Now I shoot sRGB for this because honestly, it doesn't matter. I'm shooting raw. It's going to be pro photo once it gets into Lightroom. Anyhow, this is just what the embedded JPEGs inside the raw file are going to be and sRGB is probably a little bit better for the back monitor here and we'll talk about that when we get to that portion of this menu here but for right now let's just go to file naming I got a little distracted there now as you can see it's DSC but instead of the default what I like to do is put the camera name there so I'm going to put Z 7 and then a number 2 so I know this is my Z72 so that's how I'm going to do that hit OK and if we go to back to the file naming menu, you can see that where it says sRGB and Adobe RGB, instead of DSC, we now have Z72. So now if I'm looking at my images and I have a variety of cameras I shot that day and maybe something's wrong with one of them, I can just glance at the file name real quick and I'll know exactly which camera was responsible for that image. So that's kind of handy to have. Or which camera I shot it with, you know, if I just want to know for my own reference. Primary slot selection, I'm going to use a CF Express card, just double check on that one. Secondary slot selection is overflow, that's how I usually do it. I shoot wildlife, some landscapes, some macros, and the interesting thing about doing those types of photos is that I don't really have to worry about a backup because I've never once had a deer sue me because his portrait session didn't turn out. So I leave that on overflow. Image area is going to be FX. But there are a variety of other options here. For the most part, I just leave this on full frame. Image quality is JPEG normal, which I don't want. I'm going to shoot just straight raw. So that's NEF raw. I'm not going to bring JPEGs along for the ride. I can make JPEGs later if I want to out of those raw images. Image size. 
Let's see here. I don't care about the JPEG, but I am interested in the NEF. I don't want to make sure that is large, which it is by default, so that's not a big deal. But I do like to go in here and double check. You don't want to surprise when you're out in the field and then you come back and you think you have these great images and something wasn't set right. So I just like to look. Raw recording. And in this case, we have raw compression. We have lossless compressed. That's the only one you should really use on an icon. For the other options, we have compressed which is a lossy compression, so it's gonna throw data out. So unless you're super desperate for card space, I would not do that. Then we have uncompressed, which again, there's not really any good reason to use this because lossless compressed is the exact same data, just smaller. So there's no reason to use uncompressed either. So my recommendation, stick with lossless compressed. Next we have ISO sensitivity settings, and we'll give that a click, head in there, and before we get too far here though, if the bottom four options are grayed out, you're probably still in the green auto mode on the top on your little exposure dial there. Switch to something like manual or aperture priority or something and you'll have access to the rest of the stuff I'm about to show you. So ISO sensitivity is going to be 100 for now. This is just our regular ISO sensitivity. And I do have auto ISO on because I shoot with manual and auto ISO all the time. So this is usually turned on unless I go to full manual mode, then I shut it off, obviously. But for right now, this is turned on. Maximum sensitivity on this camera, I like 12,800. Actually, no, this is a Z7. On this camera, I like 6,400. On the Z6, I like 12,800. So that's where I'm going to cap everything out. And that's pretty much all I'm going to do right here, right now. So I'm going to hit OK back out rather all right white balance is auto auto works pretty well i actually do like the natural light auto a little tiny bit better though so i think i think i'm going to switch to that one picture control automatic is fine with that color space this is where you can select srgb or adobe rgb and again I do want to emphasize that this is for raw shooters. This is just going to be the color profile that's embedded in that JPEG inside the raw file. And since I'm shooting raw, I'm just going to use sRGB. If you're using JPEG or something, sRGB is really probably still the best bet. That's the one that most screens and displays are going to use. So most of the time I do recommend sRGB. It's not as wide a color space as Adobe RGB, but for JPEGs or embedded JPEGs, it works really well. Plus, I'm pretty sure that the monitor on the back of the camera is probably not a full Adobe RGB gamut. I think it's probably closer to sRGB, so it's going to give you a little more accurate color, I believe, on the back of your screen here. I can't prove that, but that's kind of my feeling about it. Let's see here. What else do we need? Next, we have long exposure noise reduction. You can turn this on or off depending on what your needs are. I like to kind of just put it on by default. Basically, what it's going to do is shoot what's called a black slide if I'm shooting a longer exposure. I believe it's like over two seconds, might be over one second. I don't remember for sure. But what this does is it takes a black slide. So basically, you take your image and then the camera takes another image with the shutter closed and then it can map that noise and compare that to the noise that you have in your other image and it can reduce the exposure a little bit even on a raw file so I do like using that. The disadvantage is you don't want to use it with stuff like star trails or things like that where you need one right after the other you don't want that pause because however long your exposure was the black frame exposure is going to take equally long it has to otherwise the noise reduction technique would not work so but this can help reduce noise on your longer exposure images and again we're talking i think over two seconds long next we have high iso noise reduction i just leave this on normal this is a this is not really a raw setting this is for jpegs and for tiffs and things like that this is not going to affect your raw files unless you're using capture nxd and then whatever you have set in here nikon will by default set in Capture NXD, but if you're using like Lightroom or something else, this setting is ignored anyway. So I just leave this at normal so I can have kind of a realistic idea when I'm looking at my JPEG previews on the back of the camera after I shoot something, how noisy it is. So I would recommend just leaving that on normal. I'm not worried about that one or that one. Diffraction compensation uh, doesn't really hurt anything, especially for raw files, so I tend to leave it on. Let's see, metering, matrix, flash mode's fine. Now, right now we have some focus mode options. I'm not worried about those at the moment. I'm going to change this to AFC eventually, but we'll do that later. Auto bracketing, let's go down here. And finally, we have silent photography. So I'm going to turn that one on. That's kind of my default for that. 
I like using silent photography when I can. You do have to worry about rolling shutter a little bit with faster action subjects, but for the most part, it's not a problem. And you avoid any kind of shutter shock issues as well. This is basically using the full electronic shutter. The mechanical shutter does not get involved. So I tend to leave that on most of the time. I don't do anything in movies, so I'm going to move down to the regular custom setting menu. Okay, so let's start with autofocus. Give that a click. And before we get too deep into this, though, I do want to point out that I have a different video that covers the Nikon autofocus system. It was made before the Z6 and Z7 Mark IIs, but pretty much everything in that video is still going to apply to the new cameras. And that video goes over the functions and customizations in this autofocus menu in much, much greater detail than what we're going to do here. This video is simply designed that, we're, that you're watching now to show you my basic menu setup. So if you want a lot more information and a lot more detail, make sure you check it out. I'll put it in the card above. So our first options are the A1, A2. These are the AFC and AFS priority selections. There's very little reason to change those. So I leave AFC in release and AFS in focus. So I'm not going to touch those. Those are just fine as they are. Next, we have focus tracking with lock on. Again, that other video, I do explain this in much greater detail. And I go into a lot of detail in my book as well for this one. But just the really quick version of this is that blocked AF shot response is how your camera is going to respond if there's a drastic change in distance under the current autofocus point. Like when a tree gets between you and maybe a flying bird that you're photographing. So the idea here is that if that bird is flying behind a tree, we want our camera to not focus on the tree, but wait a second until the bird shows up on the other side of it. So we use this function to tell the camera how long it should wait if there's that drastic change in focus. Now, the other thing that this is used for is if you're in a situation where you're tracking a bird and you find that you seem to lose focus quite a bit, you might have it set too quick and delayed would work better. On the other hand, if you're tracking the bird, maybe you accidentally focus on the background or camera accidentally focuses on the background. You put it back on the bird and you're pressing the AF on button and nothing's happening. It seems like forever until it refocuses. Then you need to go more towards the quick side so that it latches on faster. For most people, a setting of three is a good place to start. But if you find that the autofocus is too sticky, go down towards the quick end of it here. And if the autofocus is letting go too easily, go more towards the delayed side of the little bar right here. But again, for more info, make sure you check out the other video. It goes into much greater detail about this. For now, I'm just going to leave it at three. And that is not a set it and forget it, by the way. I will jump in and out of there as needed. But for right now, I'm just going to leave it at the default. Next, we have focus points used. And I always kind of go back and forth on this one. This is one that I jump around with a little bit. We have two options, all or every other point. Now, the first thing I want to point out is that this is not the autofocus points the camera is using. These are the autofocus points that you're allowed to select inside the viewfinder. So basically the camera can still use every single autofocus point. So you're not like crippling it by going every other point. But what this will allow is for you to get that autofocus point to travel across the viewfinder much, much faster since you're going every other point up and down. So if you're in a situation where you don't need super, super precise AF placement, but you do need to be able to move that autofocus point around, that one half option is really, really good. For the most part, I kind of anymore have been leaving this on all points unless I run into that situation. But if I am in a situation where I need to move the AF points around a lot, I don't hesitate to jump back in here real quick and go to every other point. But I think for right now, I'm just gonna leave it on all points. Next, we have store points by orientation. I really like this feature. I'm going to give this a click. This is just a yes or no. I'm going to turn this on. And what this is going to do is it's going to remember the AF point position for horizontal shots and then for vertical shots. So, for example, maybe I'm shooting a bird and it's flying horizontally and I focus on that bird. And then that bird flies by and while I'm waiting for another bird, I spot a, you know, maybe a nice great blue heron and I focus on him. But in this case, I want it vertical and I want that focus point on his eye. So I move that up to the eye. But when the next bird comes flying by, I don't want to have to recenter it. So when I turn the camera horizontal, what this will do is it'll go back to that center AF point position for me. And then when I'm done with him, I, it'll go back to the vertical point position for the other one if I want to keep photographing that bird. So it's kind of a handy feature. You do have to be careful with this because if you forget you turn it on, you might be like, how come every time I turn my camera vertical, the AF point moves? It gets a little confusing. And by the way, to set it as far as where your AF point position is in the viewfinder, simply move the AF point to where you want it when the camera is vertical or horizontal and then it'll remember you don't have to really do any kind of 
you don't have to really do any kind of setup or button presses or anything like that. It just kind of does it automatically. Next, we have AF activation. This is how we turn on and off back button focus, basically. So I'm gonna give this a click and I'm gonna go AF on only. And what that's gonna do is it's going to take autofocus off of my shutter release and it'll just be on the back AF on button. And that's how I want it for right now. Next, we have limit AF area mode selection. Now, in the previous Z cameras, there wasn't a lot in here, so I never really went in here and unchecked anything. But basically what this is gonna do is if you have your autofocus area like set to a button or something and you wanna press it and turn and cycle through your autofocus areas, this will take those extra areas out of the equation. So it makes it a little faster to cycle from like pinpoint to dynamic to wide without running into AF areas that you don't use. So in this case, I'm gonna leave pinpoint on and I'm gonna use dynamic. Wide area small, that's actually one of my favorites. I'm gonna leave wide area large. But when I get to wide area AF for people, that's one I'm gonna uncheck because I don't take people pictures at all. So I'm just gonna uncheck that. And to uncheck that, uh, just again, use the side of the multi-select button. Wide area for animals, I'm gonna leave that one on, for now at least. Keep in mind that animals are you know, pets in this case. It doesn't really work well for wildlife at this point. Hopefully a firmware update will correct that. But for right now, as of the recording date of this video, just use it for dogs and cats. So we have auto AF area. I very seldom use that normally, but I do use the tracking mode sometimes. So I'm gonna leave that on. Auto AF area for people. Again, I not, don't do a lot of people photography, so I'll uncheck that. And I'll leave the one on for animals and I'll just hit okay. Now when I cycle through my autofocus areas, I won't get the option for the people wide area there or the one for auto area AF with people. Neither one of those will show up. So it'll let me get through these a little bit faster when I'm cycling through. Next we have focus point wraparound. This is probably what you think it is. If you have an autofocus point and you're wiggling it towards the right or left side of the frame, once it gets to that edge, should it stop or should it go to the other side? I leave this off because I'm not coordinated enough to know what to do in it you know, jumps to the other side, so. Focus point options, I leave those on the default. The low light AF though, I do like to turn that on. That's actually really good on these cameras. And there's not really a huge downside that I've found by leaving that on. If the light's so low that the camera's not able to focus, it'll just automatically flip over to this. So I think that's pretty good. Next we have the built-in AF assist illuminator. I'm gonna shut this off. I don't really want the camera shooting out a bright green beam at my animals if I happen to be in low light. So I'm gonna shut that off. So moving on here, we have now our metering and exposure options. And for the most part, I leave this alone. There's nothing in here that I'm gonna bother with here. So I'm gonna move on down to the timers and AE lock options here. Shutter release button, AE lock, I'm not gonna use that. I don't like that at all. Self timer I'm not worried about. And we have the power off delay. And if you look, the C has a little asterisk. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I did modify this so that I could actually do this video with you. But I'm gonna go in here, I am gonna make a change. So playback, 10 seconds. I like to have my playback go a little bit longer. There's nothing more frustrating than examining an image on the back of the camera and having it shut off. Well, maybe there is something a little more frustrating, but anyhow, I'm gonna to go to 20 seconds on that. Menus are set for five minutes. I probably will come back in here and reduce that time to one minute later on after I'm done shooting the video. Image review, four seconds. That's if you have the image review set. If you take a picture, it'll show you on the back of the camera for four seconds. I'm not worried about it because I don't have image review set. Standby timer set for 30 seconds. I'm gonna increase that to one minute. Now I had this much higher with the first version of the Z cameras because I was running into problems where it would power off the camera, go into standby mode rather, and I needed the camera to be active instantly and the camera was really, really slow to start up. These cameras start up much faster, so I'm going just with one minute on this because even if it does go into standby, it's not the, I don't know, photographic death sentence that it was before, so I'm gonna leave it at one minute. I can't promise that down the road I won't change this to five minutes, but this is how I have the Z6 II set. I've been using that for, I don't know, almost a month now, I guess, and it's been fine. So that's that. I'm not worried about my continuous low speed shooting mode. Extended shutter speeds, I do like this. You can have the camera go up to like 900 seconds. I think that's 15 minutes or so. So I do like to have that on. I don't use that feature very often, but 
And if I do, it's probably not for a 15 minute exposure. It'd be more like, hey, I want to go one minute instead of 30 seconds. But I do like to have that on. Next, we have limit selectable image area. I'm just going to show you this one real quick. You can go into different crop modes and this works just like the limit the AF area mode option did you saw a little bit ago. If you happen to have one of your buttons set for image area and you don't want to have to go through all of these, you can shut any of the ones you see right here off if you want. For the most part, I just leave this on, but I did want to make you aware of it because that's something that sometimes I've messed with before, so I thought I'd mention it here. The next one I want to talk about is apply settings to live view. This is one change that I've made from my Z6 and Z7, the original, the Mark I cameras. This one I usually leave on, believe it or not. With the old cameras, when I was shooting action, I would turn this off and I got a little better performance for autofocus doing that. However, this camera doesn't seem to have that same issue. So I leave this on all the time now. And so far I've not found any real benefit in turning this off, even when doing birds in flight, it seems like focus has been really good. So right now my recommendation is to leave this on. Again, you know, these cameras haven't been out for a terribly long time. I may change my mind on this down the road. But for right now, I'm leaving it on. Next, framing grid display. That's a heck yeah. We're going to give that a click, turn that on. That'll put a grid overlay in your viewfinder. Focus peaking. I'm not worried about that right now. I'll assign that to something else later. Not worried about that. Not worried about that. All right, nothing there. I am going to go down to the customize eye menu. I'm going to show you how I set up my eye menu for my cameras here. So let's do that next. So we'll give this a click. And the way this works is you just select the little slot here that you want to modify the little box here, if you will. So I'm going to show you how I typically set up the eye menu. And we'll start with this little box right here. Give that a click. And this allows me to choose anything that I want. Now, one really cool option we now have with the Z cameras, let me see if I can find it here, is that we can put focus shift shooting right on the eye menu. And that's something I use all the time, so I'm going to do that. And what then I'll do is when I click that, it'll bring up the focus shift shooting menu so I don't have to menu dive for it. I can just hit my eye menu, click this, and the focus shift shooting menu will pop right up. So that's really handy. Now over here, I'm going to put ISO. So I can adjust my ISO sensitivity settings from here if I want to. And I think over here, I'm going to put silent shutter mode. I like to have fast access to that. Most of the time I do have it in silent photography mode, but sometimes I want to turn that off and it's nice to have it on the eye menu. So again, I don't have to go to the photo shooting menu in order to do that. Next for this box, I'm going to give that a click. And for this one, let's put, choose image area. I like that one. If I want to quickly go from full frame to DX or someplace in the middle, I can do that. Not everybody wants to change that in the field. Some people want to just do that back on the computer. It's the exact same thing, so no worries there. However, the reason I like to maybe sometimes do it in the field is because it'll give you a little bit more room in the buffer and it doesn't take up as much room on the memory card. So sometimes there's occasions where I will, if I know I'm going to have to crop it anyway back at the computer, I'll go ahead and just come in here and make that crop right out there in the field. So that's an option. Let's give this one a click. I don't generally use flash. So I don't need to worry about flash mode too much. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go up this way and I guess it's the other direction. I'm looking for focus peaking. There we go. I like to put focus peaking right on the back of the camera because I do a lot of live view work and a lot of times I need to change those focus peaking settings and it's annoying to go all the way to the custom function menu to do that, all the custom setting menu rather, and do that. So I like metering where that is. And let's go here. We're going to replace Wi-Fi connection with something because, again, I don't really use Wi-Fi with this. So I'm going to go down here. And I'm going to use exposure delay mode on this one. Sometimes I like to use exposure delay. And finally, we have the last slot that I'm going to worry about right here. Give that a click. And that one is going to go to all the way down here. 
custom controls, that will give me quick one button access to the custom setting menu. And there's a lot of times, because of what I do, I'm constantly bopping in and out of there for the educational stuff, for the books and stuff. So it's handy to have that on the I menu. So that's about it. That is my finalized customized I menu. I'm gonna leave the other four alone. Vibration reduction I want on there. Keep in mind, if your lens has a VR switch, that's what's in control, the menu does nothing. But if you have a lens on there that does not have VR, then it's controlled through the menu. So sometimes it's handy to have that. Then we have the release mode, continuous high or single or whatever. We have the AF area mode, I think that should be on there. And then we have the focus mode like AFS, AFC. I don't have a lens on here, so we just have AF slash MF right now. But that's, that's it. So I'm gonna hit done. And that is all there is to the customizing the eye menu. That's how I do it. Now, one more quick note before we go, just because the customizations you see here work well for me, that doesn't follow that they're all gonna work well for you. This works pretty well for me. I found that this is a nice combination of settings here, but you know, I'm still adapting. I'm still modifying these sometimes depending on what my shooting needs are. And you should do the same. Don't just copy what I have here and say, this is the ultimate way of doing it. It's definitely not. Everybody should have a different eye menu when they're all done because everybody has different priorities. Okay, next we're gonna to go to custom controls. Give that a click. And again, I've set nothing here, but before we get into this one though, I do wanna mention, I do have a dedicated video all about this. I think it's 10 or 15 minutes. It goes into really deep detail about why I do the stuff that I do in here and how I customize it and stuff. This is just gonna be a very brief overview, but if you would like more information, definitely check out that video. Once again, I'll put a card above, so you can go do that when you get a chance. So let's go ahead and jump in and I'll show you these. So the first one is the FN one button and it's conveniently highlighted there on the camera as you can see. That one I set for spot metering. I took the long way around there, sorry about that. Then I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna set this one to AE lock hold. I'm gonna go back up towards the top here. There we go. I like AE lock hold because what that's gonna do in conjunction with the spot meter is that I can spot meter first and then I can press that second button and that's gonna lock in that exposure. Then I can release the button and because it's AE lock hold, it will retain that exposure until I either shut the camera off or the camera goes into standby mode or I press the button again. So this is really handy if you need to spot meter off of something and then recompose or if the thing's moving around and you don't want the exposure to change. And that's usually how I spot meter. If I'm spot metering, I probably want to lock down that exposure. So I'm gonna spot meter and then I'm gonna lock it in and then I can just shoot away at that exposure until I decide that it's not working anymore. So that is a nice combination. And again, in that other video, I go over that a little bit more. Then we have AF on for our AF on button. I'm gonna definitely leave that one alone. So next let's go down to the joystick, the sub selectors Nikon likes to call it. Give that a click, and I want that one to reset. That's what I'm looking for. So that's this top one right here, reset, and that is going to center the autofocus point for me. And I know the OK button does that, but in a moment I'm gonna assign the OK button for something else you'll see in a second here, in a little bit. So that's reset. Now the lens function button here is the one that I like to use for tracking. So I'm gonna go find that one subject tracking there it is so if i'm in one of the auto af areas and i have a lens with a function button which i almost always do i can press that button and that will initiate subject tracking for me most of my lenses do not have a secondary lens function button at least none of them that i own now so i'm not going to set anything there but i am going to go to the movie record button because this is one of my favorite customizations and sorry for kind of going around the block on you there and what i'm going to do there is i'm going to go down to the press and command dials area and i'm looking for the focus mode af area mode option and i'm going to give that a click and what'll happen is if i press that little highlighted button you see there the movie record button and i turn my command dials, the back one is going to change the AF area and the front one's gonna change the AF mode like AFS, AFC. So that's a really handy feature to have. Now I know a lot of you are like, well, why not just put an AF area mode on something like the FN1 button, like we do with the D500 and the D850 and the D5 and the D6, etc. right? Well, unfortunately, these cameras at this time do not support that functionality. You can't do it. There's no option to put an AF area mode 
on a function button. So because of that, and that would be my preferred way to do it, but because of that, I ended up doing this metering thing with them instead. So that's why I have that on the movie record button. So even though it's not going to instantly jump to a particular AF area mode, I can at least you know, scroll through it very rapidly without taking my eye away from the viewfinder. So that's pretty fast. I don't mind that one at all. Okay, so you may have noticed that the screen changed a little bit there. Now we have another option down here on the bottom. That's because I didn't have a lens attached to the camera and without a lens attached, you don't get this. Now this is the lens control ring and right now it's set for aperture. So if you happen to have a native lens, a Z-mount lens that has one of these aperture control rings, you can actually turn it and adjust the aperture. To me, that's kind of useless. I don't like that at all. I can reset the aperture the way I've been doing it with the dials. You know, I, last time I set an aperture like that was way, way, way back when, when they were on the lenses. So I'm not real worried about that, but there is a cool function here that we didn't have in the past. And that is exposure compensation. And that's the one I like. So now when I turn that dial, it will set my exposure compensation. And that is the best, fastest way I've ever seen to set exposure compensation. And I just can't wait for Nikon to come out with some longer native glass so I could take advantage of that with my wildlife photography and not just with my landscapes and that that I do with the 2470. So that's a really, really cool customization. So anyhow, that's, again, as I said before, if you need more info, definitely check out that other video. And once again, I do want to emphasize that just because this works for me doesn't mean this is a good combination for you. I'm just trying to get you started here. If this works for you, great. If not, you know, feel free to customize the way you want. That's why we have so many options. All right, next, let's go to the OK button. Give that a click. And this is where I'm going to make some modifications. Now, in shooting mode, right now it's set for reset. But if you recall, I changed the joystick press to reset. So I'm going to give that a click and I'm going to turn this one into zoom on and off. And I'm just going to make sure it's at hundred percent. It is. And that's what I want. I want to go zoom on and off. And the reason for that is simple. That way, if I am using my camera, I can just click the okay button at any time and I can zoom in to wherever the autofocus point is and examine very closely what I'm looking at. That is a huge benefit. And it's just right there on the okay button. I love having that. Next, we have playback mode, and that is set for zoom, and that's fine. It should be at 100% by default. It is, and that's all there is. That's all we want to do on the OK button. But, yeah, that's a really cool customization there. Next, we have customized command dials. I'm going to give that a click. And the one I want here is menus and playback. The rest of this stuff I don't really adjust, but menus and playback actually has a neat feature. If we turn this on, and you can do with image review excluded, I just turn it just on what happens is when we hit the play button on the back of the camera we can use our command dials front and back to go through our images so if I use the back dial it's going to be one image at a time if I use the front command dial it's going to be 10 images at a time this is super handy when you're trying to review a bunch of images on the back of your camera and you don't want to go one by one or flip through them with your finger you know on the touch screen one by one these are really really fast controls to use so I highly recommend that one so moving on down and the one last option here is the assign MB and 11 buttons option that is for the grip and I definitely have a grip so I want to assign those so the FN button is the first one that's the one directly behind the shutter release on the grip and I like to set that one for exposure compensation because there's nothing more frustrating let's go here exposure compensation there's nothing more frustrating than needing to use exposure compensation when you're in a vertical orientation and not being able to reach it. So I'm going to click that one. But obviously there's a lot of options there. The AF on button is correct. And the multi-selector looks like it equals, does the same thing as the multi-selector on the camera. And all of that is exactly what I want. That's perfect. Everything else is good. It's just that function button is far more useful to me for exposure compensation. But you can use it for ISO or other things too. So that is that. And let's go back. This is the movie stuff here. I'm not going to adjust any of that. I don't really use the camera for movies at all. Okay, so finally, I am going to wrap this up by going down to the My Menu area here and showing you what I do with My Menu. Now, you have two options here. The first one is the obvious one. You can add items, and you can add pretty much any menu item to this for quick access if you want to do that. And, well, that's handy I tend to use different menu items all the time. So what I do instead is I go down to choose tab 
And I'm just going to start by saying before we get into this, that what I do doesn't necessarily mean it's something you should do. For me, this works well. For other people, it may not. So I'm going to hit choose tab. And instead of using my own custom settings, I'm just going to use recent settings. And what this is going to do is anytime I use a menu setting, it's going to put it under the my menu area. And the reason I do that is a lot of times when I use a menu setting, I do need to come back to the my menu area and reset that setting. If I'm testing a camera, if I'm doing something, a lot of times I want quick access to that menu setting. And maybe it's not necessarily something I put under the my menu area, but let me show you how this works. So I'm going to go to autofocus and I'm just going to change this to three from where it was there at one. And then I'm going to go back to my menu. And you can see that the last thing I messed with was focus tracking with lock on. And I can go ahead and click that and it'll take me directly to that menu. And to me, that's really handy, especially for something like this. This is a setting I tweak frequently. So that's something to consider there. So for me, the bottom line is the reason I like this is if I'm in a menu, there's a good chance I'm going to need to go back to that menu if I'm tweaking things, either with focus track with lock on, or maybe I'm using exposure delay, and I can have fast access to that right here through the My Menu option. So that's the one I use. But again, your mileage may vary. There you go, my complete menu setup for the Z6 and Z7 Mark II cameras. Again, make sure you check out the description area for this video on YouTube or on the blog post at my site for the related videos that do go much deeper into detail on some of these topics. By the way, if you enjoyed this video, I think you'll really like my ebook, Secrets to the Nikon Autofocus System, the Mirrorless Edition. The AF system in these cameras is tricky, and without really knowing the best practices, you aren't going to get the maximum keeper rate. If you want to learn how to get the most out of your Z-Series mirrorless camera, make sure you check it out. Finally, make sure you sign up for my free email newsletter so you never miss a video, a live stream, a workshop, an article, a new book, you name it. Also, if you have a photography question or just want a fun place to show off your photos, make sure you check out the BCG forums. In fact, can't wait to see you there. Finally, make sure you like subscribe, and get notified. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great day.